Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to the first Back Garden Biology uh, video of 2021. Um, I decided to make a couple of these in the winter because obviously we're all in a rather dire situation right now uh, with Covid surging again, people very worried about that and also schools possibly being shut uh, for the first few weeks anyway, still some uncertainty around that. So can you get outside and do something outside that might make you feel a little bit better about this horrible situation? And so I thought one of the things we could certainly talk about would be trees. Now, of course, in Britain, most of our native trees are deciduous. So you might think that the winter is not the best time to look at them because they've lost all their leaves. But actually, by stripping away all the leaves, you can see what's left. And what you see is the magnificent structure of a tree this fantastic trunk and the branches and the twigs is really laid bare in a way that enables you to see the, the wood for the trees if you know what I mean. Now we should remind ourselves first of all just how incredible trees are. This tree is massive, it might be 100, 100 years old, 150 years old. It's an oak, one of our you know most beloved native species and what I find most amazing about trees is this thing weighs actually I don't know hundreds of tons maybe certainly tens of tons and where has all that mass come from well out of the air you know this tree has pulled itself out of thin air and really thin air because what it's got to grab out of the air is carbon dioxide and that's a very small fraction of the air around us but it can capture that carbon dioxide it can what we call fix it uh, by combining it with hydrogen which it gets from water and it makes organic molecules and that's where the mass of this tree has come from. So every time you look at a tree you should just remind yourself just how absolutely fundamentally amazing they are. But what I want to look at today is a few of our best loved native trees and help you to identify them in the winter when you haven't got the leaves to go on. So how do I know this is an oak? Well partly from the bark. The bark is very distinctive here, you can see it's really quite rough, deeply crenellated, but lots of horizontal breaks as well. Um, and if we scour up the trunk, you can see the incredibly twisted branches. So oak is one of the, of only two species up here anyway, in the Whiteham Woods near Oxford, that's where I am, which can make these amazing kind of twisty S-shaped branches. It's very characteristic of English oak, Quercus roba, but there's another tree that can do it as well, and we'll see one of those in a minute. So here is another very common British tree. It's the ash. So it also has quite deeply um, riven bark, like, a, like the adult oak does. The adult ash also has this quite rough textured bark. Um, but what you do notice about the ash is it tends to grow very tall and straight, especially in a woodland setting. You can see it's shot up. It has two major branches then, rather than maintaining a single trunk. But you can't see any of the twisting and turning like you could see on the oak. None of the, the sort of S-shaped branches that you get with oak. And you can also see at the top, or um, maybe we can just pan up again at the top, looking at the branches, you can see lots of keys still hanging there. Ash produces little keys with single wings and they often sit on the tree through the winter. Uh, ash fruited very heavily this year and there are loads of ash keys. Ash is really good at dispersing, those keys can travel far and it's good at popping up seedlings. The big problem for ash now, as you may or may not know, is a new disease called ash dieback. And that uh, has been in Britain probably for at least 20 years and it's sweeping through Britain now and really noticed it this year. If you hadn't noticed it in previous years, a lot of ash looking very unhealthy and starting to die. It's caused by um, a fungus, something called an oomycete, which is an unusual type of fungus. 
uh, and it's really out of control and it's not really clear how we're going to deal with it or what impact it's going to have if it does indeed wipe ash out of British woodlands, which I'm afraid is a very real possibility. We just found an oak and an ash growing together here in a way that really nicely shows the differences. On this side, that gigantic, wonderful tree is an oak. You can see all the amazing twisty, turny branches. That's a Quercus rover, an English oak. Pan to the other side and you've got a mature ash tree. Much smaller, much lower volume of wood, not nearly as twisty, turny, but the bark really quite similar. And you might see on the top there a few of those dead keys. Excellent. Now we said that most of our native British trees are deciduous, but we do have three native conifers. They are the yew, the juniper and the Scots pine. And there are some Scots pine trees growing behind me here. You can see that lovely reddish colour to the bark, that's very characteristic. And they have almost like plates on the bark, they almost look like they're flaking off. Uh, and at the top you've just got all the needles that are slightly bluish green. And what you can see from looking at a tree like that is how trees grow when they're in a woodland. All the needles from those Scots pines were right on the top. And that's because if you're growing in a woodland, that's where the light is. In the winter, yes, the light gets down to the forest floor. But once these trees leaf out, the only light to be had is up there in the canopy. And that's why trees grow straight and tall in order to get to that canopy as fast as they can and grab the light. We've stopped by this pretty crazy looking tree. You can see at the base of it, there's just this extraordinary profusion of small branches forming like an enormous shrub at the bottom from which the trunk appears to be coming out of. And you can see it's multi-stemmed with more than one main trunk. And that's that bushing at the bottom, that extraordinary profusion of branches is a characteristic of lime. Now lime is something that you don't see very often in woodlands. It's most of the lime we see in Britain now is a hybrid lime and we grow it in town centres. People don't like parking their cars underneath it. If you come back and you find your car is covered in sticky stuff, you probably parked under a lime tree. They produce blossom in the spring, which produces a profusion of nectar and it pours all over any vehicle that's unfortunate enough to be parked underneath. But lime was part, is part of the original British woodland. So Britain was completely carpeted in forest until the end of the last ice age, when gradually humans recolonized Britain and started to cut down the wild wood and clearing the land for agriculture. But we know what that wild wood looked like from pollen records. And we know that lime was quite abundant, but it disappeared very quickly once humans arrived. And one of the reasons is lime is good eating. So amazingly enough, the leaves are very, very soft and the young leaves are edible. And also the bark is very edible. You can strip off the bark and eat it. And I wonder whether that great big profusion of branches is some kind of anti-herbivore deterrent that the lime is doing to stop too many deer coming up and browsing at its bark. But I don't know that, that's my speculation. Just pausing quickly by this, this is a younger ash and it's just to remember to be careful when you're looking at bark. So bark can change quite dramatically as a tree ages and young ash has this quite smooth bark and as they get older the bark gets much more crenellated and rough. So that's just to be aware, uh, the age of the tree is quite important when you're relying on the bark to tell you what it is. If we could pan to the top, we can see some of the, the old keys hanging on there that reveal this to be ash. Ash also has characteristic black buds in the winter, but it's been so mild that these are already greening up. So we've stopped by something that we could call a veteran tree. Look at this huge thing. It's got so much character. It's all gnarly. You can see the history of its growth. You know, it's got multiple stems. Some of them have fallen and broken away. This is a tree that's starting to senesce. It's a beech tree. Beech is the dominant tree of Europe. If we just let Europe go unmanaged and covered in forest, beech would be one of the dominant trees. It's a really great grower. It grows incredibly well in the European climate. It's got incredibly hard wood. Uh, and uh, my partner was just telling me, really difficult to core. You can age trees by coring them and you have to manually grind in a cylinder to extract a little core of wood so you can count the rings. 
Of course, with deciduous trees, they put on a growth spurt every year and then they're dormant like they are now in the winter. And you can count and measure those rings to find out how old they are and how much they grew in every successive year. And it's really tough work to, to core the beech and that's partly because of this very thin, slightly slippery bark. This one's older, so it's getting a bit rougher as we've often seen, but the young beeches are very smooth indeed. Uh, what's quite amazing about the beech is the way that they can grow so differently. You know, each tree can become a real individual and you can see something about its history. A lot of beech will just have a single main trunk, especially if they're growing in a forest, but this one doesn't. And maybe something happened to it. So somebody might have been pollarding it when it was young, taking the top off. That means that they throw up multiple new branches and, and one of those becomes the new leader. And so it's created this huge shape. It may be that it never had other trees growing close around it. We just saw how if you've got to go to the canopy to get the light, if you're crowded out by other trees, that makes a tree go tall and straight and on a single trunk. If the light have got lots of light around them, they'll try to capture as much of that light as possible by putting out branches in all directions. And that's why you can get single individual beech trees growing alone or in a gap, which can be truly enormous. So something a little bit different here. This is not a canopy tree. It's never going to get as tall as a beech or an ash or an oak, but it is a very familiar tree to lots of people in Britain and it's hazel. And hazel, as I said, is an understory tree uh, and it has some really characteristic, interesting things. So a little bit like the lime, you can see all this young growth shooting up from the base, but it's not a tangled mess. These young shoots are very straight, these long straight poles that the hazel produces. Now this hazel isn't being actively managed, so it's still got big trunk in the middle, it's still quite a you know, medium-sized tree. But if you wanted more of those hazel poles, you would do something called coppicing. And that's where you would cut it all off at ground level around every 15 to 20 years. And all the regrowth would be those long, straight poles. And they were hugely valuable in the past. You know, now you can buy timber any shape you like because we've got steaming and uh, sawmills have this ability to steam the wood so they can bend it and shape it but they couldn't do that in the past you had to actually buy the wood out to grow in the shape that you wanted it to be and for making wattle and daub walls and fencing and hurdles and all kinds of useful things the hazel was the number one choice and that's why a lot of British woodlands was, were managed like that the nice thing about coppicing is when you chop all the trees down to ground level like that you let in all the light and you get this great flurry of woodland flora all the primroses and violets and ox slips that can grow on the woodland floor and will gradually diminish as the trees grow taller and the light levels fall. Now hazel produces catkins and they're starting to come out now. You can see this is them elongating. They'll be much much longer than that by the end of the time they really start to produce pollen. They're, they're pushing out now and they're really quite advanced again because in fact it's been a very mild winter. So in this part of the woodland at Whiteham, we've got a little grove of birch trees. The birch bark is really familiar. It's the only tree with this whitish bark. Again, this is an older tree, so it's not quite as clean and white as the younger one here, where you can see even more of this smooth whitish bark. Uh, there are different varieties bred for gardens, which are even whiter and starker than that, and they look really great in the winter. Birch also produces catkins, they're too high up for us to show them, but they're elongating away now as well. The problem with birch, actually, if you grow it in your garden, is that the pollen is highly allergenic. So I certainly have an allergy to birch pollen. I've got a massive one growing outside my house. But never mind, those catkins as they elongate, I really notice the birds love them. So there are great tits and blue tits on there every day. Must be a good place for insects to get in. Maybe they're able to get some kind of nutrition out of them. Birch is what we call a pioneer tree. Uh, it's very good at invading open ground. It produces vast quantities of really tiny seeds and it's not a very long-lived tree it's relatively weak so you know it can easily get blown over and snapped after a heavy snow load or a big storm now you might be forgiven for thinking that this is an oak tree it's got the deeply fissured bark it's majestic and growing in a really interesting way and if we pan up we can see there's a branch with doing all the s-shaped twisty turnings but this is not an oak 
It is a sweet chestnut and the bark is slightly different. It's even more deeply ribbed and it seems to have these sort of great sweeping longitudinal sense of it somehow. It's just a little bit more impressive somehow than the oak bark. Sweet chestnut is not native to Britain, but it is native to Europe. And you know you're standing underneath one, if it's a big one, because there's all of these on the ground. And these are the prickly cases in which the chestnuts reside. The chestnuts themselves have all gone because no doubt they've been eaten by, by the squirrels of which this wood is full. But sweet chestnut was introduced to Britain. There was a time in the 19th century where people were very keen to try out new kinds of trees. Horse chestnut was brought as well, of course. The sweet chestnut does grow quite well and obviously with a warming climate it's possible that we'll see more and more of it in our woodlands. So here's another small tree, not a canopy tree. You can see it's on a little stem like this and then it branches out into a great shock of small branches and you can see these little berries on it. And you might be thinking, oh, it's, maybe it's hawthorn which has little red berries. But if we focus in closely, we can see that the berries, there's a pink outer part and then a bright orange berry in the middle. They're a little bit past it now. If we looked at them a month or so ago, they would have been even more beautiful and impressive. And this is spindle. Uh, and that is a lovely native tree with these beautiful fruits. Really nice bit of winter colour if you've got room for one in your garden. Okay, well that's it from me for now. Take care. It's scary out there at the moment, but if you do get a chance to go outside, I hope you can have a better look at some of the trees around you and their skeletons and their silhouettes and try to work out what they are and maybe reconstruct their entire lives because you, you really can see that in some of them and you can see how each individual is just a little bit different because it's had a slightly different life. They don't grow like you and I according to a, a very predetermined plan. They make their own way and they might move off to the left or move off to the right or grow some extra branches depending on the environment that they find themselves in. Well, till next time, take care.